so folks can hear. I want to set the stage for you today. The common lectionary takes us uh, for a New Testament lesson to uh, the book of Revelation. And where we are in this piece of scripture is we are where John the Revelator is having a dream, a vision, if you will, and he is standing before the throne of God. And he sees individuals clothed in white, and he inquires as to who they are. And so that's the scene in which we find ourselves. And there is an old picture of John the Revelator, and he's staring up at God, attempting to see what sits before him. And so this is the book of Revelation, the seventh chapter, verses 9 through 17. And it reads as follows. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes, and peoples, and languages, standing before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to be our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them, or any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of the living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, Thanks be to God indeed. So I want to back up. And let's go through and, and let's, let's talk about a few things and see if we recognize them. Wilbur, you're going to recognize some of these this morning. So I want you to look at this. That no one could number, so we don't know them from tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne. So people from all over the world, from all time, standing before him. At the time of Pentecost, what was there? People from all nations in all tongues stood before the Lord and could understand one another. What else did we see? They stood before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. When did we see palm branches? When Christ went where? To Jerusalem. When? Right before he was crucified. So now we've tied all people, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, are standing before the Lord with a Christ person, a Lord, a Savior, who has come in with palm branches being waved before them. And salvation belongs to our God. So now God is claiming salvation. Salvation belongs to me, God, no one else. No one else. And they fell on their faces. They said, Amen. And blessings and honor and power to God. And then they had a great question. Who are these people in white? And he says, they made them white in the blood of the Lamb. He's basically saying what? They're here because Christ died. And then we finish up with all of these things. They'll show hunger no more. 
The sun will never strike them with scorching heat. All of these things to tell you that there will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. They will be in a place where the presence of God is all that there is. There is no other entities around them other than God and his presence. And so I want to I want to borrow from Matthew's gospel for a minute. And he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father in heaven. That's Matthew 7, 21. I don't know if yeah, I guess you can see it. What color are those words? Red. So there's Christ already telling you that you can call upon my name. You may call me Lord. But if you don't do the will of my Father, there is no place for you in heaven. And we all know somebody in our life that is that person. They'll talk about the Lord and they'll talk about Jesus, but they don't do the will of God and they will tell you that they're not really saved. So they'll call upon the Lord when things get tough, but they don't really know him. And Jesus himself says in the book of Matthew, therefore, don't expect to see them in heaven. So I still continue to ask you, who are those people in those white robes? They are these people, right? Who is the white robed people that John the Revelator talks about? It's those who say, Lord, Lord, and do the will of God. Let me say that again. It's the people that say, Lord, my Lord, and they do the will of God. There was a sermon that I preached that wasn't too bad, I don't think, Nelson. Not too bad. That we're going to get to in a minute. But who are these people? They're the saints. And yes, you know some saints. If you're sitting here, you're likely one yourself. Now, it's tough for some of you to swallow. Because we love all the saints, right? Even the Catholic Church really loves their saints because they name ch everything after churches, right? Saint, Saint Catherine's, right? Saint John, Saint Luke, Saint Matthew, Saint Mark, Saint Timothy. There's more saints than you can shake a stick at. And those are the people we think of, right? Biblical people, biblical heroes. Those are the folks we think of when we think of saints. We don't think of ourselves as saints. But I got news for you. You know some saints. So my mother-in-law's church, Wicomico Presbyterian Church in Salisbury, Maryland, had a request go out for All Saints Day and wanted to know if anybody should... Uh, request prayer for one of their family members on All Saints Day, that that would be welcome. And I kept looking, and I kept looking, and I kept looking, and nobody, absolutely nobody on their Instagram feed was putting anybody's name. Nobody. And so, couldn't help myself. I said, there's a gentleman that served in your leadership as the leader of your church in the lay community for over 30 years. And he was a powerful and faithful servant of the Lord. And his name was Harold Huffington, my father-in-law. And I've never met a more godly or deserving man to be in heaven in my life. And you all that know me and have known me know how I feel about my father-in-law. And what he meant to me. And what he still means to me. And then you know what happened? Folks started putting names out. Folks started putting names on Facebook. So the pastor called me. She said, I could have figured that you'd start some trouble. And I said, what kind of trouble have I started? And she goes, well, now I've got to preach a sermon on saints because no one knew who saints were. I said, well, then you better come listen to my sermon because that's exactly what I'm going to preach on. Because we, people don't recognize saints in our midst. They just don't. 
And more importantly, when you all look in the mirror, many of you don't see yourselves as saints. And so I want you to think very clearly and very hard this week about your life and your personal ministry and how you treat one another and, and how um, saintly you are. I'll pick on some folks. Granny, if you're not a saint and there's no place in heaven for you, then I know there ain't no place for me. Just saying. Just going to be up front and honest with you. Stevie Downs, if there's no place in heaven for Stevie Downs and you're not a saint, there ain't no hope for Cam. Just saying. And I can go on and I can go on. That's folks I'm picking at. So there's hope for you and me, Matt. Because there's saints in our midst. We've got to get to the point where when we say, do we know saints? That we're bold enough in our faith to say, yeah, I'm a saint. Because saint has gotten a bad rap. When we see, say saint, everybody wants to go to the vision of the perfect person, the person that does no wrong. Well, you better go back and look at some of those people that we call saints. Saint Paul, he had some flaws. Saint Peter, he had some flaws. Saint Matthew, yeah. Where are the saints and who are they? And are we willing to identify them? And are we willing to hold them up as an example? See, we have Christ as the example that was, and I'll say was, in our midst. And the only way he remains in our midst is through the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works in and through each of us. And so if we want people to know what Jesus looks like and how Jesus ministered and how Jesus thought, we have to have examples here on earth of people who are doing that. We have to be able to point to someone and say, that's a person that if you wanted to know how to treat folks and how to serve your Lord, do what Steve does. Do what Granny does. I hope that at least somebody would say once in a while, do what Cam does. We have to be a reflection of Jesus in the now. Because Jesus isn't going to walk down that street unless it's the second coming. So who is going to walk in his stead and show some grace and some mercy and some love and some respect and some forgiveness and some kindness? If it's not you, then who? And if it's not now, then when? Because this is, a, this is not a, an hour-long thing. This is a forever thing, right? And so I go back to that wonderful sermon that you sat through last week, Nelson, and I say this to you. There's only one, there's only two real requirements that God put before us when Jesus spoke those red letters to us and told us, here's the commandments that you need to be involved with. To love and respect the Lord and to love and respect others accordingly. If we can get in the habit of that, there'll be more saints. And there'll be more saints because more folks will be saved. And the more folks that are saved, the bigger this salvation piece of our faith becomes. Because at the end of the day, we should be winning disciples of Jesus Christ. And if you're a true disciple of Christ then you have put on one of those white robes. And you have made a public proclamation that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. The next hymn we're going to sing, and i got a little more preaching to do, is I Surrender All. When you get to a point, church, in your life, when you can truly surrender your life to the Lord and you can become saved in the blood of Jesus Christ and you become saintly, 
the world can be changed. When Christ came, he changed the world for the better. But then God was very clear. In order for the world to remain changed, you must live in love and serve as my son has lived and loved and served. Because if you're not willing as someone who has claimed victory over sin in the name of Jesus Christ, if you're not willing to serve and make a proclamation and identify the sainthood that is around us, then how is anybody else ever going to see it? And I know that the last month and a half I've preached in a direction in which may sound like a broken record, and that's by design. Because church, I think that we're, we still don't get it. We still don't get it as a faith community that is centered around Jesus Christ. We still don't get it as a body of Christ that people are struggling and they're searching and they're wanting. And they got to want what you have. But you got to make darn sure that you have it. Because Jesus himself said in the book of Matthew, the folks that are going to be in, the, in heaven aren't going to be just ones that said, Lord, Lord. They're going to be ones that said, Lord, Lord, and do the will of God. So what is the will of God? The will of God is to love me as you love no other and to do the same for everybody that you know and come in contact with. That's so easy and it's so tough. It's easy to love people that we already love. It's tougher to love the unlovable. I wanna leave you with this. How much is a person's soul worth? And I don't like hypotheticals, but I'm going to leave you with this hypothetical. Would you sell your house and give all the proceeds to whomever or whatever if you knew that would guarantee one person? eternal salvation in heaven? Would you give your biggest possession away if you knew that it would allow someone to live forever in the presence and in the kingdom of God? And if you're not willing to do that, are you willing to give them your time? Are you willing to spend a few minutes with somebody and provide a living witness and a living testimony? Are you willing to be a saint for a little while? Are you willing to sit down with somebody and just meet them where they are, for who they are, and tell them that you love them and that you serve a great God? a mighty king, a warrior? Are you willing to do that? And if you're not willing to do that, then we know you wouldn't give your best possessions away. But are you at least willing to give the message away? Are you at least willing to not condemn but console? Are you willing to help up and help out instead of push down and lock out? Are you willing to hug? 
Are you willing to love? And do so in the name of Jesus Christ. For those brothers and sisters are the people that are in the white robes. And I know you can name some too, but I know for certain that Harold Huffington is waiting at the gate. And I'm waiting for him to tell me all the things that I've been pondering for years. And I know Mildred Sheldon is waiting at the gate. And she's going to ask me what took me so long. And I know that John Clark Spencer is waiting at the gate. And he's waiting that he can fuss at his baby girl, my mama, about not going to church enough. Because I know they were saints. But notice I said that I'm going to see him. Because I've claimed victory over sin. I'm imperfect. God knows that. And if you ain't figured out your pastor is flawed to the nth degree, please see me after worship and I'll tell you some of the stuff I do on a regular basis and I'll dissuade you of that. But I know this. I will see those saints again dressed in white robes because I have claimed victory over sin, because I have claimed that Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior, and I have made a commitment that I am going to say that as, as loudly to as many people as I can, because I am in the business and you should be in the business of salvation. We should be in the business of bringing folks, not to this building, not to Harrison's building, but to the body of Christ. It doesn't matter if we were standing in the middle of the woods having worship, our whole being should be winning disciples to Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And the world cannot be transformed until it's transfixed on the scriptures, until it's transfixed on the cross, until it's transfixed on the person who was fixed on the cross. And if I seem a little fired up this morning, I am. The reason I'm fired up is because the Lord has put it on my heart and I hope that he has put it on yours to be an agent of change in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to do and sing what we should do all the time anyway. And that's surrender all. Let us raise our voices and sing.